All right. Well, last week, Pastor Ben got us into our new series, surveying all of the Bible. Uh, one week per book of the Bible. That's our goal. And so he had the massive challenge of beginning with the book of Genesis last week and taking us all the way through Genesis, uh, a flyover, if you will, a bird's eye view. We want to make sure that while on Sunday mornings we're, we're taking a walk through the forest, that these are more of um, a flyover, seeing the forest and not necessarily down in the trees, right? We don't want to miss the forest for the trees, and so it's valuable to get down on the level of the text and walk through it slowly like we're doing in Matthew right now, but also to do this flyover on Wednesday nights. And so I hope you're edified by it. I hope that the books of the Bible that we're encountering um, are less intimidating um, to venture into, to understand, and to read for yourself so that you can gain insight uh, so that you will exalt your God from the inside out. And so tonight we encounter the book of Exodus. And there's a lot that we can say about this book. It's another long one. It's uh, 40 chapters long. But the title itself, Exodus, comes from the name given to this book in the Septuagint. Now the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Sometimes to uh, look in uh, a book maybe you're reading on Bible study, you'll see the abbreviation LXX, and that stands for the Septuagint. How they got that, I don't know. Maybe you know, Greg, but uh, I don't know where LXX comes from, but it stands for the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Exodus, uh, which is that Greek word for Exodus, means exit, departure, or going out. And this is a reference to the main event in the book of Exodus, which is the people of Israel departing Egypt, having been freed by God from their slavery under Pharaoh. And so their Exodus, coming out of, being delivered from bondage under Pharaoh and the peoples of Egypt, coming out of that through signs and wonders that we'll talk more about here pretty soon, and coming out into um, the wilderness and then on their way to the promised land as God's people. So that's a little bit about the title. Now, Ben got into the authorship of Moses last week, and so if you would like to know more about that, we're, we're working on making the recording available. We did record last week, and so uh, we're going to put it out in some kind of podcast format. Uh, I think Chris Moore is still working on that, so more information to come. Uh, but if you would like to know more about Mosaic authorship, you can look into that. But we, we take um, the traditional approach that says that Moses was the author of the first five books of the Old Testament, which are called the Pentateuch. And so we don't need to say much more about that. Now, what about the date of this book in particular? Now, this, uh, this is something that has been debated hotly for a long time. And I'll, I'll just tell you, there's a lot of um, archaeological evidence um, that goes into answering this question, when was the book of Exodus written? And so I'm going to give you a couple of um, texts for, for us to consider. I'm not going to get into all the archaeological evidence for why we believe it's either this date or that date. But the date of writing for the book of Exodus is debated, thus providing us with an early and later date that is dependent on the date that's attributed to the Exodus event, like when the event of them um, coming out of bondage and out into the wilderness, when that happened, right? So if you want to look with me at 1 Kings chapter 6, we'll, we'll see a reference inside scripture that's going to help us um, determine at least a reasonable date for this book and the writing of this book. So 1 Kings chapter 6, we want to look to the scriptures to in interpret scripture. And, and I would see this as, as something that is literal. If you look at 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, we read this. In the 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. 
And so we have here um, some precise years used speaking of the people of God who are coming out of Egypt. And the date is 480 years prior to here, now the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel. And so taking that literally, then people have said, well, then a good date, an early date for the Exodus would be um, 1446 BC. Right? That's an early date approach, but there's also a late date approach that sees the mention of a city named Ramses in Exodus 111 as an indication that the Exodus is dated within the reign of one of the pharaohs having that same name, claiming that 1225 BC is the historical reference. And so because there were a number of pharaohs that had the name Ramses and they were um, reigning during the 1200s into the 300s BC, or th- I mean, 1200s into the 1300s BC, then uh, the later date is espoused by some scholars. I tend to lean toward the literal interpretation of 1 Kings 6.1 and take an early date approach. I think that uh, just looking at the scriptures, that seems mo- most logical because if you were to take the later approach, then you would have to argue against the literal interpretation of 1 Kings 6.1, which uh, I, I don't have um, any reason to do that. Okay, so that's some important dating knowledge there. But again, the, these things, while they're important... We're not going to spend a ton of time on the dates, right? And I think the reason why we're not going to spend a ton of time there is because we um, accept the Bible as God's word, right? We accept it as inspired. We, we believe that it is not full of errors. We believe that it's truthful, inerrant in every word. And so if you accept the, um, the word of God as that which it is, God's word, then we don't have to talk about all of these dates and establish them and make sure that we have everything buttoned up into a T, do we? We can say, okay, let's, let's get down to the truth. What is it saying? How do we observe it correctly? How do we interpret it correctly? How do we apply it correctly? And that's really what we want to spend our time talking about. But it helps for us if we're going to spend time in God's word, studying it for ourselves, and maybe doing a group study, if we map out the structure of these books, right? Again, you want to get the lay of the land. And so how is it broken up? And I I like what Tremper Longman and Raymond Dillard do in their introduction to the Old Testament. They have a a three-point breakdown when it comes to the book of Exodus. You see it there under structure. So first, we have God saving Israel from Egyptian bondage, which takes place in chapters 1 through 18. You see the precise verse there. And then the second section would be God gives Israel his law. They're freed from captivity. They're out now um, in the wilderness. They go to Mount Sinai. They receive the law of God. Moses goes up to the mountain to be with God, receives that law. And so that's the section wherein God gives his revelation to his people. Um, The third section is that God commands Israel to build the tabernacle. And we see that in the last section of the book. And that becomes extremely important when we're talking about the presence of God with his people. Okay. And so uh, we'll talk more about that here in a little bit when we talk about key themes, but you need to understand that the tabernacle has everything to do with the presence of God among the people of Israel. Okay. So now here's another breakdown that's just helpful. These two R's that uh, Bruce Wilkinson and Kenneth Boa use in in their talk through the Bible resource, uh, redemption and revelation. It's maybe a a helpful way for us to remember how it's broken up, okay? So instead of doing it in in two sections, the way that they look at it is that first section in chapters 1 through 18, that's redemption, right? Redeeming the people of Israel. And we'll talk more about how that's done, right, through the Passover lamb, right? If we look in chapter 12 into chapter 13 in particular, and so that's redemption, that that whole, uh, it's that part of the book wherein God's delivering them, and part of that is that um, he uses the Passover lamb, which has great significance when we get to the New Testament. But then there's that second half of the book in 19 through 40, which is revelation. And so it's God revealing his law, right? Speaking to them, 
Here is what you're called to do. Here's what I'm commanding you to do, to be my people and to glorify my name and be set apart unto me, consecrated for my glory. And here are the precise things that you need to do to establish the tabernacle so that um, I will be among you in, uh, I will come and draw near to you in that place. So that's redemption and revelation. Helpful way to look at these things. Now, let's talk about a couple of key verses in the book of Exodus. Exodus 6.6, 6, you see there. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Exodus 19, 5 and 6, another key verse. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And so you see here, there is both the redemption in verse 6 of chapter 6, right? Um, that he's going to deliver them from slavery, right? I'm going to redeem you. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and, a, and great acts of judgment. And then there's the revelation aspect when they are now the people that he's choosing to glorify himself through, to set his love upon and reveal himself to so that they can be set apart and act as that holy people that he intends for them to be among the nations, right? So redemption and revelation, as you see. Now, I want to spend some time going through some texts in this next section um, under key themes, okay? So let's think about this together. Um, let's, first, before we actually get into the ones that are listed here, I want us to go to the beginning of Exodus, and let's talk, give some context to this book, okay? Exodus. <clears throat> Look with me at verse 8 of Exodus 1. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithon and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad, and the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in the mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field. And all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So Exodus picks up where Genesis left off, right? The, the narrative of Joseph is where we see Genesis leave off. He is like the prime minister of Egypt at the time right? Very important, second in command. And because it's been now been hundreds of years, there arose now a king, another pharaoh, who did not know Joseph. And so because there's not that knowledge of Joseph as one of the Israelites, right? One of the sons of Jacob, then there's an abandonment of all mercy, all grace to these people. And the people of Israel have grown to be many in number at this point, right? From 70 to now um, estimations of over 2 million. And so many, many people, you can understand why uh, an, a godless man like Pharaoh, someone, I would say, uh, we should say a pagan man like Pharaoh would want to oppress them and to keep them um, down so that they um, aren't, an enemy aren't a threat to the Egyptians. You can see why he would want to do that with them growing to such a number over those hundreds of years. So that's where we are contextually. And so the people that God has chosen to be his people, right? 
Abraham being the first Israelite, being given the promise of blessing that there would be this nation, right? This, this, that his offspring would be as the stars of the sky and there would be the promise of land and blessing being given to him. Now we've got the people, they're many, but they're oppressed, right? They're, they don't have the land promised to them, the promised land at this point, right? They are in a serious situation. So in being under oppression and being in bondage, what happens, okay? God is the sovereign deliverer. It's a major theme that we see here in this book. There's sovereign deliverance. And so look with me, uh, starting in chapter 3. Chapter 3 comes to us after we have the preservation of Moses. He's not killed as a Hebrew baby. God is in charge of that providentially, no doubt, right? And um, he actually murders an Egyptian, right? It was uh, Mark Dever who was writing in his, his book um, called The Message of the Old Testament. He was writing about the fact that when people see Moses as, as this great deliverer figure that they point to, and, and often he's, he's uh, put on a pedestal, um, they forget that this is a murderer who they're exalting, right? This, this man um, murdered a man, and he fled to Midian as a result of this. Now, praise the Lord, murderers can still be redeemed and used for God's glory, and that's what we see here happen in chapter 3 of Exodus. He is in Midian, he now has this family, and God comes to him, the burning bush. Look with me at verse 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But I point to this text because I do see in it sovereign deliverance. It's there, look. He says, I have surely seen the affliction, right? Verse eight, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Now he's using Moses, but God's saying, I have come down to do this. I will free my people. I've heard their cries and I'm coming to get them. I'm gonna use you, but it's God who's doing it. And certainly every, every time um, God um, saves a soul, right? Gives his people um, sweet mercy. It's um, often through a person. That person is not the deliverer. It's the God who's using that person. And we see God in charge. Now, um, here's something interesting that we see. There's a lot of repetition of this point in, and it starts really in chapter four, verse 21. But look, Listen to the sovereign deliverance we, we discover in verse 21 of chapter 4. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. He's going to harden the heart of Pharaoh against God's people. Now, if you keep reading throughout the book of Exodus, you see a number of more occasions where God says that I will harden Pharaoh's heart, but also there's some occasions where um, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart, which tells us God is sovereign over this, but Pharaoh is still responsible for his heart. 
I think that's the balance we see. But God, again, this, the, the way, this is the first account we see of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, and it has to do with God doing the hardening in this first occasion that it's mentioned in chapter 4, verse 21. God is doing this. He's hardening the heart of Pharaoh against his people. Why? So that he can put himself on display in rescuing them. Last week, um, Pastor Ben, or he, he was either last week or the week before, he talked about that book by James Hamilton, uh, God's salvation through judgment. And you see that time and time again. We'll talk about that more in a minute, but God saving through judgment. And so there is this display of God acting in a judging way, but he's doing so so that his people can be set free. Yes, Pharaoh is responsible before God, but God is also the ones hardening his heart so that there will be this awesome display in the plagues and in the Red Sea encounter that God is shown to be awesome and so that he will be feared and known. So there is, if you were to go through the book of Exodus and just start highlighting all of the, the verses that show God acting for his people to be the one that's coming to get them. And yes, he's using Moses. Yes, he's using Aaron, of course. But this is God's work. We saw that last week too. Ben drew that out of the book of Genesis, and we see it continuing on in the life of Israel in the book of Exodus. God is not this weak, milquetoast God that some people think when they think about Jesus, when they think about the God of the Bible. No, he is powerful. He is to be revered. He is one who is going after his people. He will not fail when he sets himself to do something and he decides it will be done. There is no one that can thwart his hand. It's what that's what um, Nebuchadnezzar says after he spent seven years acting like an animal, living like an animal, because he was walking out on the roof of his palace, and he was the most powerful man at the time in the book of Daniel, and he's, he's looking at the land of Babylon, and he's boasting in himself, and God strikes him down. And for seven years, he, act, he, he lives like an animal. And then his reason comes back to him, and what does he say? He says to God, or says about God, none can stay his hand. None can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? In Isaiah 46, God says, I have purposed and I will do it. If he has planned it, no one's getting in his way. We serve an awesome, sovereign God. And the book of Exodus puts this on display dramatically. So sovereign deliverance is a key theme. But then salvation through judgment. Salvation through judgment. Look with me at Exodus 7, 1 through 4. Now we have Moses and Aaron. They are here with Pharaoh. Listen to what Yahweh says to Moses. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his hand. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. There it is. I'm going to bring them out by judgment. Not judgment on the people of Israel, but judgment on Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. Uh, Egypt. So that's the judgment that's going to be laid out and the salvation will be given to Israel instead of judgment. And so it's very clear. The enemies, those who are hardened, those who are unbelieving, those who are worshiping pagan gods, they will be judged. The people that God has chosen to set his love upon will be rescued. Look at me at chapter 14. This is the chapter where we see the Red Sea event take place. We read this in verse 13. Thank, again, salvation through judgment. Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Just sit back and watch him work, right? 
This, see how awesome is this judgment that is coming. You'll never see these enemies again, he says. I love that. You'll never see them again. God's going to fight for you. You just be silent and watch. In sovereign, powerful judgment that leads to salvation for God's people. Look at 21 through 28 now. Same chapter. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Now, I'll just say this. As a, as a kid, I remember reading like comic strips and... Uh, I remember the far side, you know, and, and they would always, like there was this one far side comic where um, they had Moses looking in the mirror in his bathroom and he was parting his hair like this, you know, and, and I, I, we, we laugh at that, but it's not like Moses had that power, right? Because it says here, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back. Yahweh did that. Again, he's using Moses as an instrument Certainly, but God is doing this. He's taking the water and dividing. He's making the sea as dry land so that the people of Israel walk across it. This is God's doing. And the people of Israel went, verse 22, into the midst of the sea on dry ground. The waters being a wall to them on their right and a wall to them on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them and to the midst of the sea all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And in the morning, watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. Again, the Lord's doing this, right? Drove, so that they drove heavily and the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. That's what the Egyptians are saying. The Lord is doing this, right? They're not saying, oh, it's Moses. They get it. They know this is God. This is Yahweh. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had fallen them into the sea. Not one of them remained. Again, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, 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 each, each time is doing this, saving his people through the judgment of the Egyptians. And the hardening of Pharaoh's heart each time, by the way, if we're thinking back to the, the ten plagues that God sends upon Egypt, then each act of hardening provides another opportunity for God to display himself and to save through judgment, right? That's the glory of this. Without the hardening that God is doing, there wouldn't be another opportunity for him to send the plague and therefore glorify himself and then rescue his people in this awesome spectacle that we see in the book of Exodus. Sovereign deliverance, salvation through judgment. We also see the consecration of Israel. By consecration, I mean uh, that they are the people that God has chosen to set apart unto himself, right? They are his people. Now they're going to be a theocracy, right? Where God is um, their king and he's going to be giving them a law to obey unto his glory and as his holy people. So they become this uh, this. Uh, theocracy where he's the king and they're meant to obey him so that they uh, set, they're set apart among the nations as his people. So look with me at chapter 8, verse 23. We see this setting apart even in the plagues. God is going to be doing this. There's a difference between the people of Israel and the people of Egypt says, thus I will put a division between my people and your people tomorrow. This sign shall happen. So it's the sign of the swarm of flies. But he's saying, I'm going to divide, right? My people and then the Egyptians. And so my people aren't going to feel it. Your people are. 
We see that again with the Passover that we'll talk about in a minute as well. They're set apart to be his holy people. And that begins even here. But then when they're out, they're delivered, they're redeemed, we see verses like this when God is establishing the Sabbath in Exodus 31. And the Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. We've got these, the establishment of the Sabbaths. It is meant to be a sign so that you will know that the Lord makes you holy, sanctifies you, um, sets you apart as his people so that he can display his glory and his love and his holiness through you, Israel. You're consecrated. You're taken out and you're made his for his purposes. And so that's an important aspect of the book of Exodus. Now, something else, this, is, this might be my, my favorite key theme that we see, and that is salvation for exaltation, okay? God delivers his people, he redeems them, but time and time again, he tells us the reason for that. Look with me at chapter 6 again. Chapter 6, verse 7. Why is he doing this? Why is God saving this people? Again, it's not, it's not because, and we read about this in the Old Testament, right? It's not because they were many in number. It's not because of anything special in them. He's choosing them. He's setting them apart for himself. But why? Verse 7 of chapter 6. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, right? So he's, he's doing this. And he's saying, you shall know I am the Lord who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I'm doing this so that there will be this knowledge of my greatness, that I have rescued you. Look at chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants. Why? That I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Now, take this, and, and if you're an underliner or you're uh, a person who likes to mark up your Bible, then you can uh, put brackets or underline each time in verse, verses 1 and 2 where it says that. Now, those are giving us the reasons why God is going to be performing these signs and these miracles when it comes to the plagues and the Red Sea. Why, have he, why has he hardened the heart? of Pharaoh and his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them. Show. Why else? And that you may tell, right? So you can tell your son, you can tell your grandson how I've done this, how I've dealt harshly with the Egyptians. So you can say, here's what God did for us. Here's how he saved us. Isn't he awesome? And then why else? Why else has he done this that you may know that I am the Lord, that I am Yahweh? So don't have any doubt in your mind. So he's saving the people of God for the exaltation of his great name. Salvation for exaltation. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but we should make a transition from that point to us in the New Testament church age today. Why does he save us? For exaltation, doesn't he? He saves us so that we will no longer live for ourselves, but for him who, for our sake, died and was raised. That's 2 Corinthians 5.15. He saves us so we wouldn't live for us, but so we'd live for him, so we'd exalt him, right? 
He saves for the glory of his great name. And that's what's absolutely best for us is that we would be saved and then we would have him as our focus, him as our treasure, him as our supremacy. And so the the same thing is true for us in the salvation he's given us in Jesus Christ. He saved us for the purpose of exaltation. Not that we would exalt ourselves, but so that we'd exalt him. Look with me at chapter 14. Again, the Red Sea event in the Exodus. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, speaking of uh, the Israelites, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. That's what's going to happen because he's going to fold the water back over Pharaoh and his chariots. And then who's going to get the glory? God's going to get the glory because he did that. And, and even we saw, right, that they know it's Yahweh. It's happening and they're like, he's fighting for, he's the one fighting, it's Yahweh, it's the Lord. Even the Egyptians see it and know it. Now, after they're saved, after they've come through on dry land to the other side of the Red Sea, the Egyptian army has been vanquished by the sovereign deliverance of God, then here is this song, this beautiful song of Moses. And this is what we read starting in verse 14. The peoples, right? Speaking of like the nations or the people groups, you could say. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed trembling seizes the leaders of moab all the inhabitants of canaan have melted away he's saying this is this is the effect of the nations when they hear about what's happened to the egyptians by the way the egyptians are the world force of the day right they're the most powerful people of the day in this time in history and they're the ones that have been overcome He did it with Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon later on. He did it with the Egyptians back here to establish himself and to show that he is Yahweh. He is God. And so we read that here. He's saying this is the effect of the nations. And by the the time when we get to Joshua, actually, you get to Joshua, the conquest of the promised land, right? And they go into Jericho. You remember Rahab? She's the one who exhibits faith and her and her family are saved out of the people of, of Jericho. But she had heard right? She and her family, everybody knew what God had done at the Red Sea. She talks to the spies about it because there is this knowledge. This wasn't done in a a little corner where no one knew about it. This is something that gets spread around. And so, yes, the nations tremble when they see the judgment that God has brought in order to bring salvation to his people. Salvation for exaltation. That's why he doesn't. He still does it with us today. Okay. What about the contribution of Exodus to the whole of Scripture? Well, the Exodus is seen as the monumental event of the Old Testament. The saving of God's people from bondage and setting them free, putting them on the road to the promised land and establishing them as a nation. That's the monumental event of the Old Testament. Some people say, What the cross is to the New Testament, the exodus is to the Old Testament. Now, we would say, well, but the exodus points forward to the cross event, right? And that is uh, central to the biblical narrative. But God's people in this event are freed from slavery, put on the road to the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, making their way to the promised land, they now exist as a theocracy with the establishment of the Mosaic Covenant at Mount Sinai. References to the law of Moses, right? The law that he gives, he gives the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai and other ordinances and other um, laws. References to the law of Moses are abundant throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see the psalmist delighting in the law of God. We see prophets calling Israel to return to it because they're rebellious and hard-hearted and stiff-necked. And the, the prophets are saying, return to the law of Moses, repent and come back. And then in the New Testament, the apostles tell us that Christ fulfilled the law. 
Now, we don't live under the law, but we live under grace. doesn't mean that, that we don't look to the law and say there's benefit for us in the law now so that we can know how to please God, but we are not living under the law. We're not bound to it because Christ fulfilled it for us. What about the gospel in the book of Exodus? Well, we haven't talked much about the Passover because I was waiting to get to this point. Right? So um, the Passover, look with me at chapter 12 in Exodus. This is huge for us when we understand the gospel. It's this beautiful picture of the gospel in the Old Testament. And I'm just going to read kind of a lengthier portion here of chapter 12 in Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male, a year old, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the door, two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no pla plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Um, my judgment will pass over you. Right? I will not kill the firstborn in your home because you exhibit, exhibited faith and put the blood of the lamb that was without blemish on your door posts. So the blood of the spotless lamb is what leads the angel of death to pass over that home. Judgment doesn't come there because of the blood of the lamb. Right? So thinking of the New Testament, it's so clear, right? John chapter 1. Verse 29. <clears throat> this is John the Baptist, right, in this context. And the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They would have all known what that meant, right? That, that's not something that would have been mysterious. Like, why is he talking about lambs all of a sudden? Right, we're out in the wilderness and we're in the, we're in the Jordan River here. What, what's good? Lambs? Sheep? What's he talking about? Everybody would have known what he meant, right? Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. We see also in verse 30, I'm sorry, in verse 36, same thing. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And that's not the, the only time we should consider the Lamb the spotless lamb of the Passover. It's not the only time we see it in the New Testament, but if you keep turning in John, you see something important in verse 36 of chapter 19. Jesus on the cross. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken points us back to the purity, the wholeness, so to speak, of the Passover lamb that they were to take for their households. So 
you can see how clearly that lamb points forward to Jesus whose bones were not broken. And then we also see in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, an important parallel that Paul himself makes. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. That's the clearest reference. He is our Passover lamb. He's the once for all sacrifice. No sacrifice is needed after the Lord Jesus Christ because he paid for all sins for all of his people. And then, what else is gospel-centered in Exodus? What else would we say? Well, I would point us to the presence of God in Exodus chapter 40. The way that um, Exodus ends is with the tabernacle having been established, and the people, they, they, uh, they obeyed God in the making of the tabernacle. They did everything he commanded to do there. And so we read this at the very end of Exodus chapter 40. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from um, over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in it by night, and the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. God's presence there um, with the tabernacle. And isn't it interesting that when we get to the New Testament, and we see John chapter 1 speaking of Jesus, the Word, verse 14 of chapter 1, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen His glory, glory as of the Son, the only Son from the Father. He dwelt among us. Or if you look up uh, the meaning of that word, it's tabernacled. He set his tent among us. He tabernacled among us. The presence of God with the people of Israel in the tabernacle, but then we see Jesus, and Jesus is the presence of God with us, right? He's Emmanuel, God with us. And it would be a wonderful uh, we'll probably do this at some point throughout this study to trace the presence of God throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament, and finally into the book of Revelation as well. But we see it here in Jesus, who is God with us. Now, look with me back at Exodus 34. Exodus 34, 5 through 7. Maybe you've heard these verses before, but they, they are interesting and they provide this tension. The Lord ascended in the cloud and stood with, them, with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So, right, so this is chapter 34 where um, Moses goes back up to the mountain, right? And the Lord passes by him while he's in the cleft of the rock. Verse 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Okay, that provides a tension for us, doesn't it? So he is the God who is a God of steadfast love, right? an abundance of steadfast love, in fact. He forgives iniquity, he forgives transgression, but he doesn't clear the guilty. And he visits the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So, so you're left thinking, well, which is it? He forgives He doesn't clear the guilty. He's a God of love. He visits the iniquity on the children of the fathers. Which is it? 
The gospel relieves that tension. I'm happy to say. The gospel relieves this tension. Because you read that, and then, if you're studying the New Testament, you get to the the book of Romans, and you read texts like chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. But now... The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, let us remember that Jesus being put forth as a propitiation means that God puts his only son forward on the cross to receive the punishment that we deserve. The wrath, the just anger that we deserve for our sins. God put forward his son and said, he's going to be the one that takes the wrath. He doesn't deserve it, you deserve it, but for your sins, he's going to take it instead. And so the justice of God is poured out, not on you, but on Jesus, so that the love of God, the forgiveness of God can be given to you. You see how verses like this, they, they relieve the tension of Exodus 34, 5 through 7. God is just and the justifier, right? He's just, so yes, sin has been punished. No one can say, what God is this that he would just let sin fly? Like he would just let it go and, and not do anything about it. No one can say that. No one can say, that's not a righteous God who would do that because he is righteous, because he did punish sin. He was punishing it on Jesus instead of you, if you believe in Jesus. So he can be just because he pays for sin, but he can also be the forgiving, steadfast love that we need. Because in order for him to be still declared righteous, he had to provide a satisfactory sacrifice. He does so in his perfect infinite son so that he can treat us with infinite love the gospel relieves the tension we find in verses like exodus 34 5 through 7 but there's also some gospel truth in um, israel and the church israel and the church so look back with me um actually i have a the, that's a misprint here oh, no it's not i'm sorry yes exodus 19 5 let's go there exodus 19 5 we see that there is Israel points to the church. Now, Pastor Ben and I do believe that there is some promises in the future that are distinct for the people of Israel. But there is this sense in which Israel points forward to the church. So I want to share this verse with you and then point to another text in the New Testament to show you um, this glorious reality for the local church or the church universal. Verse 5. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Okay? Let's see if there's any New Testament language that sounds like that. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Uh, similar language is used there back in Exodus chapter 19. And we're even earlier. We are um, a holy priesthood in verse 5 of First Peter chapter 2. Right? A spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. And so uh, that language is used of the church as well, points forward to us now as New Testament Christians. 
And we get that because um, he has made us his people through Christ Jesus, the Savior. Okay. Well, as we finish up here, just a few points of relevance for today. We've seen a lot of sovereign deliverance, a lot of salvation through judgment, God acting powerfully, putting his, uh, his om- omnipotence on display, his judgment on display. So I think that the book of Exodus helps us today secure a big God theology. That's what we're about here. We, we, we see in the scriptures a big God. And we, we don't want to shy away from that. We, we don't want to have to apologize for God to people because we think that, oh, you know what? Yeah, he's in his power and in his sovereignty, he, he did these things. Uh, you know, I know that's, that's kind of harsh. We don't apologize for God. We say, this is what the scriptures say. I want to introduce you to this God. And yes, he does visit people. He, he does visit the iniquity. He does judge. He doesn't clear the guilty, unless, of course, the guilty are cleared in Christ. So you want to establish before people this awesome God in your own heart that helps you to worship. The more and more you see God in all of this uh, transcendent glory and all of his power, then that leads you to stand in awe of him and it leads your heart to, to leap and say, man, there is no other being like him. There's one God. There's one. There's not many gods. There's one God and I stand in awe of him and I worship him because he is so holy and beyond my understanding even. And so, we don't shy away from these big God texts. We, we let them speak for themselves. And that helps us actually to worship and also helps us to pre- present the gospel. Because if you think that there's, if you think God is weak and milk toast and passive, then you're going to exalt yourself over him, aren't you? You're going to put yourself above him instead of seeing your great need for him, following him and loving him and bowing to him, and trusting him. So I think this book helps us secure big God theology. I also think it starkly reveals the unity of the Bible. One of the clearest pictures of the gospel in the Old Testament is the Passover. It's one of the clearest illustrations of the gospel, and these clear connections that that Paul and John are making to Jesus Christ, pointing back to the Passover lamb, And so when you see such clear depictions of the gospel like that in the Old Testament, and you can draw that line all the way back there from Exodus to the first century, to those New Testament books, then you start to see, oh yeah, this is one story. With ultimately one author, right? God, yes, he used man, but he is the one that is using these men to write this one narrative, and it gives you more a sense of faith as you open up the scriptures and say, this is not just a bunch of stories that are put together that have nothing to do with each other, like a collection of poems from 18th century, you know, poets or something. That's not what it is. One book, one story. So I think it depicts for us starkly the unity of scripture. And then I would, this is, this might be a side note from the big picture of Exodus, but I was thinking about this today. Um, this shows us the importance of theology for ethical choices. Okay, what do I mean? Look with me at Exodus chapter 1. We'll close with this. This is just kind of a side note, but I think it's important. So, the, as the narrative goes, Pharaoh is oppressing Egypt in verse 15. And the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, and the other Puah, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. So why do I bring that up? Obviously, they feared God. That says it twice. They feared God. They feared God. And that led them 
to cherish life. Instead of fearing this king who could have taken them out, he could have ended their lives like that. But they say, no, we're not going to kill these children. We value life because we value and fear God. And that led them to make this wonderfully uh, pure and ethical choice because of theology, because of a right theology that led them to revere God. Isn't that important? Just little things like that you can see in passages in the Old Testament. Okay, we're out of time, but are there any, any 